and I would like to introduce our panelists, Dr. Sunil Kubani, Dr. Yatin Mehta, Dr. P. L. Gautam, Dr. Sharmili Sina, Dr. Radha Reddy Chadda. For the panel discussion, please. So, uh, good morning. And we are going to start a very interesting discussion on uh, uh, nutrition and infection addict more. Uh, most important and one of the key factors why the patient on ECMO dies, one of the reasons is malnutrition or PEM deficit and second is the high risk of infection. As we all know that most of these patients are very sick for various reasons, immunocompromised, highly catabolic and that's precisely the reason they are having protein energy malnutrition as well as they have a high risk of infection for various reasons because they are lying, they are have got different kind of lines. Even you would take best care of that hospital acquired infection are likely to happen. And around 50 to 60 percent of these patients are going to die because of the different kind of sepsis. These two issues we will be discussing separately. Uh, but the most important issue why these patients are catabolic. I will just go to Dr. Mehta directly. Uh, the ECMO patient are PM deficit, they are highly catabolic. And there are three issues which uh, make our task this, uh, difficult. One is the gut ischemia, which Dr. Pandey mentioned, you mentioned as well, the immunoamply unstable. And third is that feed intolerance. There are three factors which makes them PM deficit. So, <coughs> for a beginner, like when you put somebody on ECMO, we are discussing ECMO as a general B, E, and B, A, O, B, B, and B, A. So, how we should if there is point in assessing, is there is certain way to assess the uh, PM deficit or we have to go with certain guideline or certain rule? First thing, first question. See the nutritional status of the patient, you will assess by whatever is you are doing in your hospital. We do SCA, the same thing you do. Nutrix score and analysis are a little more difficult to do. So, but basically, it is histor historically, if you ask one a few questions and you look at the patient, you will know that patient is already malnourished. As I said, that most of these patients who are going on ECMO have had a, an illness, unless it is an acute cardiac event for which they are good, otherwise most of them would be malnourished. So you have to take the deficit also into consideration when you, when you start eating. As I said, unless the patients are VA ECMO on high anotrophic support, otherwise gut is the best thing to use. So you start with the enteral nutrition, you can give trophic feed, give less for the first one or two days. Uh, you don't have to start here unless it's a VA ECMO and you think the patient is going to be okay in two days' time, so you don't need to be the patient. Just give as free. Otherwise, you have to plan long term and you have to give the maintenance, whatever requirement of the patient. In addition, you will have to give the deficit which the patient has uh, um, uh, achieved in the last uh, several days or weeks uh, before, the, before the illness. And children, as I, like, as I said, have a much more catabolic response, so they require to three grams per kilo for weeks, and the catabolism can persist for three weeks, up to three weeks. So that also post echo. One study found that post echo, that once the lines were out, the patients were underfed for several weeks. So that is also important because we lose interest in the patient once he is out out of the acute illness, and the patient even at home the, uh, the supplement uh, not given. And the malnourishment can get worse, the worse motor weakness can persist, mobilization can be affected. Dr. Radha, very quick question. In your practice, how do you assess uh, nutritional status? You are feeding them optimally, or how should you target your feed? Is there a certain thing and just go with general guideline and certain specific point you have in your practice? We in the, uh, yeah. I am from AIG Hospitals, Gachiboli, Hedgeback. On an average, it's not about uh, ECMO or no ECMO. On an average, we have 100 patients on enteral nutrition every day. And we have at least 25 to 30 patients on parental nutrition every day. So that's the load that we have. And we have a set protocol in the hospital. It has to run by the protocol, which is agreed by the management and the intensivist. And meeting the nutritional goals is the ultimate thing that we do. We monitor on a day-to-day -day basis for every patient. It's centrally prepared. There's a feeding uh, prescription which is done. And that goes by the prescription from the centrally prepared. We go by 100% parental, uh, sorry, um, formula feeds. 
meeting the goals and we follow what is called as volume based feeding. We did this in way back in 2012 and we published a paper on volume based feeding and we follow what is called as a volume based feeding which runs hand in hand and this is mostly by a nurse driven process. Of course the dietitian is there. What we do is we ask the intensivist what is the volume that you can give for feeding for today for this patient. Apart from giving IV fluids, apart from giving medication, everything gone, what is it? Say supposing the doctor or the intensivist tells me that you give 500 ml today or 800 ml today, then we would revolve around meeting the 800 ml of the volume for nutrition. It could be 50 ml per hour, it could be 75 ml per hour, it could be even 100 ml depending on what the interruption that has happened in this 24 hour gap. Yeah. But by the end of that 24 hours, we meet the goals. And we always use a 2 calorie 1 ml product for such patients where there is a deficit. But of course, we are cautious about the occurrence of refeeding syndrome. So we go a little slow, we give hypercaloric, but we do not, do not negotiate with protein. Hi, protein. Uh, so, uh, so, certainly coming to you, uh, you know, we all know that there is no different guideline or different parameters to assess the deficit. We all go with a certain rule that this much of requirement but still after meeting that requirement we know that most of our patients are protein and energy deficit and at the end of the day all become catabolic, muscle wasted, everything happens. There is also a risk that if you overfeed, we have problem with the ECMO and metadermine, that's why right. so we balance just trying to meet the basic requirement. Basically what we do in ICU so far, if we just make a one statement, that we try to maintain the resting energy expenditure and that should be maintained in gut to function because we cannot meet the catabolic. If you try to meet the catabolic, there are complications of nutrition, that's what we have found. That's why a common formula of 20 or 25 uh, kilocalorie per kg body weight plus protein requirement varies from 1 to 3 depending upon age that's it. So if you have to give a prescription like that uh, you have to feed your patient. So how you initiate your feeding? Enteral, when you will, it is first thing, enteral or enteral, preferably enteral we know. How you initiate and how long it takes to you to reach to the goal of enteral feeding? In particularly the patient who are adding more. We always definitely prefer enteral nurses for enteral and when we start enteral always as Dr. Nanda said we start with tropic feeds and as tolerance builds up within 40 to 72 hours we aim to establish our goals especially for patients who are on ECMO multi organ supports calorie protein we have already mentioned uh, up to 25 calories per kg per day and up to 2 grams per kg per day for all patients because some of the most of them are in the catabolic state and maximum 40 to 72 hours we tend to reach our goal. Some of the patients where we have problems of drug tolerance and other issues, we try to supplement with partial parental nutrition. And uh, other aid I take or other um, strategy I follow is also using partial digested polypeptides, especially in patients who are on high dose of vasopressors, because we have noted that their tolerance, absorption, etc., is better when these patients are on high dose of. What is the common problem in phase when you start in Mostly when we start uh, feeding, it is about interfaces, I mean we are talking about this specific subset only, feed intolerances and that's something we always come into picture. We have a very established feeding protocol as well and we do follow gastric residual volume and we follow this intermittent bolus method. So we are not using continuous method. For our nursing staff, if GRB is less than 50%, we advocate to push the other thing. Suppose ATML has come, we push it and give the next 120 ml, make it over 200 ml. If it is more than 100 ml, inform the doctor and we take a decision, we assess if uh, constipation, distension, electrolyte, potassium, etc. is there, that has to be assessed and again give, give a gap and start again with a lesser volume. So this is the commonest uh, thing and second commonest is about the NPO status because uh, in a semi-closed or semi-open IC, I would say multiple field visits and for every, you know, investigations like ultrasound, blah, blah, CT scan, etc. even if it is, the CT scan is posted at 6 p.m. It should be kept 10 p.m. from say at 10 a.m. So these long fasting hours actually what we have found in our audit uh, actually lead to more of this calorie deficit, so nutritional deficiencies. So this is the two main issues we find in feeding these patients apart from their organic causes. Uh, Sunil, very specific question because you would deal with mainly pediatric patients. So uh, pertaining to your pediatric patient, what are the challenges you face in getting the target and how do you feed your patients? That's my 
previous speaker said, uh, Rajesh, we try to concentrate on enteral nutrition. One of the explanations for this why the uh, why the patient is unable to tolerate the sweet food as a part of protective response that will be deprived of oxygenation as well as blood supply when the uh, body is going through the critical care uh, responses. So most vital organs are provided with blood supply rather than the gut. So most of the times we will be successful in uh, establishing feeds, neonates and in pediatric population. But there are times when we, when we are not as evidenced by increased residual feed volumes. So in those cases we supplement with the partial parental nutrition and build it up again. Um, if the feed if the feed is not tolerated in the sense more than 50 percent of the feed volumes are there, then we supplement the rest of the volume or sometimes skip one feed and reassess the patient for the next one. I, I totally agree with my previous speakers. So we do have a feeding protocol and we follow that as well. So most importantly that nutrition our dietitians also help us by daily visits and uh, prescriptions in, in, in keeping, in, make, in making sure the patients are getting enough nutrition. Dr. Gautam, uh, uh, if you have to summarize, if a patient on B or B, or if you see, and if you have to give a prescription of that uh, today, that this target, uh, so how do you decide your prescription of daily nutrition? Because, you know, uh, most of the ECMO patients, the nutrition challenges as well as requirement, you have to daily assess and change your prescription. So, how do you help your dietitian? Or what instruction do you give to your dietitian that today this is the target and how do you achieve that? If you have certain things. I am just asking a very practical question. Uh, so, first of all, I must confess that I am not looking after the recognition most of the times because Dr. Vivek is looking at my case. But overall, uh, if you have to look after all patients, as far as the first thing is concerned, so all patients are assessed daily, whosoever in the ICU by uh, schedule approval assessment, all patients are assessed for that. Even the patient's calorie requirement uh, is prescribed daily and along with the protein. But some of the patients with a different one, like the patient is too weak or patient is uh, for a long time uh, deprived of uh, feeds, like patient with a gut surgery or patient are uh, looking at. Because we look at the refeeding syndrome, that was the number of times we look at the phosphate levels also. And making the coffee feed to those patients. So we try to prescribe, normally it's a 25 30 day rule, which calories uh, really. uh, Most of the patients, yes, for these patients, they go with the adjustments, and it's very simple, they need to go. That's ideal body weight, and just one third of what the overweight is there. But the best paradox is there, these patients. But another thing is very important is to try to understand the pathophysiology of the disease. When we are sick, catabolic activity, even if you feed, it's not going to be utilized. So there is no fund of giving feed at that time, 24, 48 hours. But if we try to feed at that time, it's detrimental. It leads to more of a hypertensive and more risk and those are times we should be fun. Because the latest paper Dr. Pandey was showing uh, that that is almost quite against the number of clients against the guidelines uh, in the guidelines. That says very clearly that when we are sick, we don't like to eat. That's a natural phenomenon, actual physiology. So that we have to understand. 24, 48 hours now. But by seven days, most of the disease, the catabolic activity is over. But in those uh, second to the fifth day, we should try to step up the feed, the way that of medicine, going up to the 70-80% of the feed, but we should start 50 to 60% from the feed, even if the risk of uh, refeeding syndrome is there. But most of the times, that should be the approach. And as far as the protein, yes. So, giving protein, most of the times, 1.2 to 2, that's okay. But making the feed feasible, that's very important. That unnecessary waiting for that because is waiting, go for that, patient is go for that, that things, procedures. No, we need not to stop much of it. If the patient is not tolerating the feed, try to find out the reasons why the patient is not tolerating. We can switch over, although best is always the intermittent feed because that's a natural way we eat. But if it's not possible, going with the trickle feed, making the head up, adding a metoclopramide or estomycin or other drugs. But we should be very careful when we are adding these drugs, they all need to prolong QT syndrome. And all these drugs, when we are patient is on age old, may be at the risk also. So these are the things we should look at, but try to feed at least 80% of what's of risk prescribed. Because even if we prescribe 30, active requirement is not, because we have done a couple of cases, the natural requirement calculation, 
uh, with the metabolic monitoring also. With a uh, putting the patient protein. Because these are ventilators have the inbuilt uh, system, we can uh, go with the uh, carbon dioxide uh, calculation. So requirement is not that high. 25 is most times good enough, but we give extra is to uh, cover up what the uh, gaps are there. And with the last question in nutrition too, uh, is there any role of uh, assessing this patient by indirect calorimetry, uh, particularly indirect calorimetry because it's coming up very fast, particularly for assessing, assessing the nutrition in ventilation. So there will be like assessing a patient who is just ventilated and assessing a patient who is ventilated plus ECMO will have a little of challenges. So first thing, we do this and if you do, uh, what are the issue and how accurate it is to predict the nutrition requirement by indirect calorimetry? Indirect calorimetry is Technically very different. Most of the Indian centers, probably they have a facility, but most of the Indian centers do not have the test. It is primarily meant for for uh, guidelines and for research projects. So I mean that is for practical terms in India that is to be not I mean not available. So I think you have to go by the standard guidelines, what are there, assessment of the nutrition status of the patient, and then you follow. But what is interesting, I just wanted to point out, is that Aspect guidelines 2010, which is 12 years old, are recommendations only for pediatric uh, ECMO patients. For adult ECMO patients, the only thing mentioned is nutritional care should be taken care of. Yes. So that's it. So what I'm trying to say is it is a high, very low importance given to it than what it deserves. It's a therapeutic uh, thing, modality in nutrition rather than a supplement. So, 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 just uh, I'll come to for last comment, but before that, there are certain points that Dr. Pandey had mentioned, and we need to be very, very careful when we start it. But only for the nutrition in patient who are anemic, for the girls, got ischemia, and we have to be carefully assessing it. And maybe just bedside ultrasound and uh, bowel, um, particularly better, we should go by ultrasound assessment and look to the brain when there is somebody not tolerating. Uh, the risk of sepsis will be very high in, because gut translocation of bacteria is very, very high in this region. Same way about the uh, uh, still phenomena, blood perfusion because it's not a vital organ and definitely blood pressure perfusion. Slightly, so you have to continuously assess it whether it's dropping hemoglobin, there is blank stool, or if you are RT showing some discoloration, you need to be very, very careful about that and definitely this modality by a multiple region and that leads to the patient to the uh, malnutrition. A last comment about uh, something special, if regard, I ask, something special you want to talk about the pertaining to the ECMO patient in nutrition. Anything you want to say about this? Yeah, uh, just to continue with Dr. what uh, uh, Dr. Mehta has said. Yes, in all patients, we can use or we do use an indirect calorimetry, which is run by the dietitian. It's a very easy equipment that has come up in practice. You can use that, and then it does give. So, what we as a protocol do is we do do it once for the patient, and then we switch over to a medical body composition, okay, which gives us a vector analysis, which does give us, and we've done a study to compare the uh, energy recommendations by a BIA, bioimpedance, electric impedance analysis, and the uh, indirect calorimetry, and see what is the difference in energy recommendation. So, where do we follow? And now, in patients like ECMO, where uh, indirect calorimetry is not possible because of the usage uh, of the process. We use a VI, which does give us a rough estimate of the resting energy expenditure, and then we go from there forward. And then compare and see, use the basic uh, 25 kilocalories per kg body weight, but we do compare and see that we are not underfeeding or overfeeding with the rough estimate that we've got from a VI also. That's what we do in fact. So, so just, to con just to conclude very quickly, that is still in nutrition. Uh, uh, we have to just try to maintain a resting energy expenditure because we still do not know what is the optimum feed. In fact, not only in ECMO patients, most of the critical use patients and higher, the, particularly in burn, particularly in head injury patients, it still we presume that they are highly catabolic, they need more. But the moment we start overfeeding, we see other complications as well, hyperglycemia, sepsis, in fact, upset requirement increases, we have. Uh, sometimes find difficult to be all this call up also start so we have to be careful about that. So still uh, we are going with the general formula of 2025 kilocalorie per kg body weight. Protein requirement varies depending upon catabolic state from one gram to two or two uh, up to two point five in some sequence. So 
three are required and then try to maintain some uh, basic micronutrients which is there. So at the end of the day, all our patients do not feed at all, their mortality will be very high. Even if we try to maintain a resting energy expenditure, we try to achieve that, it's still all our patients who are more than seven in ICU are going to be catabolic, are going to be malnourished, are going to be muscle wasted. Which one is it? Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, I mean, still I said that whatever you do, that there is always the, the problem. Why we every time de debate about nutrition is not like that. You feed little extra. The moment you feed little extra, is not only GI intolerance, but other factors which are more uh, related to the patient is overfeeding. Not only overfeeding syndrome, but volume overload, uh, increased oxygen requirement, which can hamper our weaning process. Even hyperglycemia can present exception. These are more concern for us, and that's why you have to always balance between overfeeding and underfeeding. And that challenge is going to happen because we do not have a definite way to assess. Don't be unless there are, uh, I just recently saw some, uh, there are a way coming out, they are coming a robotic thing. So, where they are going to assess your total, um, uh, total everything uh, calculated, all water and food, everything, continuous assessment, continuous ground assessment, not in India, but it's just it's a new thing it is now, and everything they feed. And simultaneously, they will assess you how much energy you are spending per hour, everything. So that AI system is going to be based not in India, but in coming time, probably will be a little accurate more. So, for, but we need to get data, but it's something prediction which looks physiologically very sound. I would like to line them only to discuss more important topic and just come like infection. Just to give a bit about the patient. Uh, uh, Dr. Before we jump to this, I want to just add one point about uh, making the nutrition better in these patients. That's a lot of being discussed on the rehabilitation also. Making the patients uh, bedside ambulation and other things, making the patient to work something. So that if you start a little bit of exercise that improves the uh, tolerance and increase in the, towards the anabolic state. That's the latest point in the guidelines also. That we should start looking uh, at that. So keep your patient away, try to move as soon as possible is the rule for all ICU patients. Whenever we can achieve, I mean, there's no uh, I mean, no second part on that. I fully agree with you, sir. So, very quickly, I'm left with very less time. It means a lot of time has gone to nutrition. So, very important sepsis. Sepsis in ECMO, patient goes on ECMO because of sepsis. During ECMO, patient develops sepsis. So, ECMO per se, because it reaches a lot of the physiological barriers, physiological defense mechanism, it is a spectrum for sepsis. And we get all kinds of infection. Uh, in ECMO, the unfortunate part is with ECMO is like you cannot apply the same rule which you apply in your foot and point body you remove. Changing the cannula, change, certainly you can change, but changing cannula is almost almost impossible that you change and change to the until less you have a very sore sign that local sign is badly infected. That part. So, coming to that, the first question very pertinent and important that all the patient, patient goes on many times, patients are in such some for some reason, or you put. They do not have a definite sign. It's still, even in diagnosis, sepsis in normal patient, patient who are infected, it is a challenge. Now, double challenge is all these patients are sedated, on visual pressure, some multiple digital, having multi organ dysfunction. So, over and above, diagnosing sepsis related to ECMO, it seems to be and pathologically and physiologically a big challenge. How to? So, how do you presume access? This patient now, this patient is going to say, so are we going to do daily some culture, daily report? Because any of the parameters we mention, any other marker, they all will be raised because you have put the patient for ECMO, on ECMO, for the basic pathology, and when you put somebody on ECMO, the second insert. So, how do you cross this challenge? How do you create this challenge? And we know what this challenge is. This is rightly pointed out that the. the uh, and this is, uh, are you understanding what question I have asked? Yes. I have given a complicated scenario. Patient is on ECMO for complication. ECMO is enduring secondary complication. Third is to maintain ECMO and basic hemodynamic patient are all part of support. So everything for sepsis is present there. And over and above, somebody developing sepsis again on ECMO with this kind of so how do we assess and try to find that? Very challenging question I have asked Dr. Mehta. So, sir, see, two things to be kept in mind is let the patient, let the patient have sepsis before you put him on ECMO. That is mostly for VDF, most for pneumonia and sepsis and septic. Then you would, that's a different scenario because the patient would be on antibiotics and he already would be infected. 
But if you have a VFO, which is for a clean case, say cathlab disaster or ACS or whatever, these are clean cases. Except for ECPR where it will be contaminated, otherwise these are clean cases. So there the sepsis is not there. Again, you rightly pointed out that there are the confounders of diagnosing sepsis, which is normally seen in the ICU, are pretty confusing when the patient is on it. <coughs> that is, temperature regulation can be go here by a patient, can be get hypothermic. TLC is erratic. PCT also, because renal dysfunction may not be an accurate this thing. And sedation patient, most of the patients are sedated to altered sensorium, altered organ function, which may be because of pathology of the echo itself rather than sepsis. So all the new indicators of sepsis are confusing in patients on echo. But there's, there's one study, they looked at the pro calcitonin, the cutoff was two. Above two, there was a pretty high possibility of patient getting bacterial sepsis. And if you combine CRV, with procalcitonin, the sensitivity was 82 percent and specificity was 85 percent. So if you combine these two along with your clinical history, then you will probably get an indicator. Routine cultures, we do not send if the patient is obviously, so you treat as you would treat a patient um, in the ICU with whatever infection he has. So you send those cultures, send the biomarkers and have a high degree of suspicion because these patients in certain Asian countries, the incidence of sepsis was about 40 percent of patients are diagnosed. And once they got that septic, the mortality almost doubled from 30% to 60%. So that is a major uh, determinant of mortality. So you have to take care of it. So, so the same question, Dr. Uh, Radha, uh, what are the cognates for the fine on it? No, she is a nutrition. Oh, okay, sorry. 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 Uh, does it have any relation about the time, patients are not known, like somebody within a week, after two weeks, or uh, it has come uh, risk factor or relevance, or uh, no, or things that is helping uh, get the, uh, picking up this big bug based on this time pattern, and uh, uh, selecting antibiotic, or bugs can be anything at any time, there is some relevance in time. Right. In my exam on this mm -hmm. multiple organs of the entity, etc., they remain at risk. And most of them are saying, depending on the VD or the VHO, they may be most likely if they are either on antibiotics or their primary indications and then secondary indications. In our experience, in our ICU's most common uh, acquired hospital acquired drugs are gram negative drugs. Clepsiva tops the list, followed by Acinotobacter, Pseudomonas, E. coli, and the others. Gram positive incidences are low in our hospital. Having said that, the time of acquiring uh, secondary infections also varies. Mostly we get it in the second week. But that is, it's, uh, there are less chances that they might get it also within one week. The second week onward, yes, the incidences of sepsis increases and it is mostly gram positive negative for us, followed by fungal infections. Very rarely we also have more gram positives, but we also suspect, like, because they are depending on the kind of culture, uh, isolated species, isolated. It would be just contaminant or colonizers so if your culture connection is not very safe. But uh, yes, it is mostly gram negative and gram fungal infections for us. Second week onwards. First week, you know, it, it could be any combination, permutation and combination. Any special thing that you feel about pediatric patients for infection? Any specific? Because they are the patients who are like having very good result on the home. And in fact, all the more study and understanding came from pediatric patients. So how do you handle the infection issue and is there anything specific about infection in pediatric patients? Well, yes, it depends on the indication for which patients have gone into ECMO. Again, you see a differentiation, yes, you mentioned earlier, meconium aspiration syndrome, these kind of cases are uh, free of infection to start with. They might get sepsis later on, but generally they get uh, decannulated within 72 hours or so. Whereas if the patient has gone on to ECMO for the sake of sepsis, then we keep on antibiotics and uh, whenever we know the organism of our cell, maybe 50% of the cases, we will bring it down to the narrow spectrum antibiotic for the duration and the practice is to de-escalate antibiotic at that time after the course and then watch for the Again, with the bacteria wise, it is gram negatives which are predominant in most of the ICUs in the world. In, uh, minimal combinations of uh, gram-positive organisms. One of my experiences is if we don't use the broad spectrum antibiotics for a longer period of time, the emergence of fungal sepsis also gets to be low. Okay. Uh, 
And just uh, before I go to my final question, there's two input about the sepsis in the ECMO patient. Because you know, uh, the confounding factor of the sepsis are present there and it's very difficult. So we go by the train. So you know, when we are putting an ECMO, we do certain basic investigation, we do more and mix, we look for the if we put the patient for the region which I can put on, and they get better, probably that's an indication that whatever you are doing is fine. But if they worsen for some reason until they, they bleed somewhere, or they have uh, blood loss, they come in angle stable, they become tachycardic, on ECMO, they develop high grade fever, something like that, any of these things. So, first thing we suspect that is sepsis and try to find out the what can be the problem with and what can be solved. That's what the rule we apply. What is that we have to be keenly observing this patient? Any physiological variation which we monitor, if they change, if we keep a suspicion that this can be because of sepsis, that can be our first trigger to find that this patient may be developing sepsis and you can investigate and change appropriate culture. If you don't think, if you think, okay, uh, this can be for any reason, this tachycardia may be any reason, if you don't apply that this can be a sepsis, probably you will miss sepsis because all the confounders for the sepsis are present in all these motions. And it's really, really very challenging that if you pinpoint sepsis because all the markers found will be high grade and will be low. Patient will be having coagulopathy for various reasons, uh, liver dysfunction will be there, renal dysfunction will be there, everything will be there. So even uh, MODS criteria may not be. So what we have to look in one word, change in the train. Whatever train we are following, if something changes drastically, and that results of parameters have to keep in mind that the equation may be different. Okay, may I ask a last question? Your antibiotic, because uh, there is also a thought that when we give antibiotic, because the volume of distribution increases in this patient, because when you put somebody on ECMO, that extra circuit of around counts to around 1.2 liter, depending upon the whole thing, it can't be good. So, volume of distribution increases. But there is a thought that antibiotic dose should be kept on higher side uh, to get a therapy appropriate, and uh, uh, although nothing can be said, just and take one minute. Last question. So, what is the role of antibiotic uh, for these patients? Any antibiotic you select, particularly the water soluble antibiotic, what dose should be given in general? That's a very good question and poorly studied question because therapeutic drug monitoring is not available except for a couple of drugs in, in India. <coughs> All the distribution is high. Initially, the GFR may be based if the patient has a high urine output, he will uh, get rid of both the thing. So most of the time, most of the time they pass a lot of, in fact, this is, a, this is one thing which you all have seen. Like in these days, three, four days, if everything is fine, they pass three, four, five hundred. In fact, you find difficult to maintain blood uh, volume because they start pass boring urine and you don't know, but we know they say stress factor is going to cause a dialysis. So, this so is volume of distribution is higher, the clearance may be increased, the protein levels may be high or low, that also is variable. So, all these things will affect it. It's a very poorly studied this thing. So, I mean, theoretically, you may be right to say that the first day when you load the patient, you may give a Give a higher dose of antibiotics, but again, it's a poorly studied. The recommendations say that you give the same dose, whatever you give to a non ECMO patient, but you monitor the blood levels, which we don't have the luxury of doing so. So, what is your practice? I'm not asking the director. Practical dose. So, I would normally give, I would give the same dose, but yes, if the patient is very sick, if you will put one gram, I may give two grams. Uh, but first dose will remain the same, and then I'll have to monitor unless the patient is on CRRT very. Drug, and then you have to follow so, so, so just to just to supplement sir, thought that what we do because uh, that's one factor and if you are then not put it maintained and uh, everything is fine we go on the highest possible dose of the what is the recommended for like if we because it's a game of example of meropenem so we give meropenem to our meta in our new standard of dose so uh, normally not, we don't select the lower term of dose in fact in all these cases we are septic they are complicated we go towards the higher dose of antibiotic because this is one area, the TDM is not as for anything, and we know that antibiotic dose <coughs> are getting affected because of the volume of distribution, uh, high urine output, and uh, excessive, uh, particularly water soluble antibiotic will get affected. So, better to keep higher dose of the antibiotic, that's what we can say, and it will be like this. One last question we can take, let me just say thank you. And, the, and uh, again, this is an important thing, that's why I said they need to have antibiotic. It's not only excreted, but they get absorbed in the circuit as well.
particularly all the water soluble antibiotic will get as well, and that's why you have to keep. Uh, so this is the, these are the important dose. That's why I said you higher dose. Many times, that's why all water soluble antibiotic we go for the maximum. Like if I put you vancomycin, I go up to three gram for 24 hour. Like a few times we go to gram uh, eight hour late, and if you put it any time we go one gram eight hour dose. So that's what we do that. Uh, it all depends upon response. Like suppose somebody start getting better, organ dysfunction, uh, organ dysfunction start reversing, with a not developing renal dysfunction. And normally, for sepsis, we give antibiotic up to 10 to 14 days. That's what the thing we follow up that we assess. But if patient is getting better with higher antibiotic, we don't reduce the antibiotic dose until we get culture. Some other antibiotic sensitivities can be changed. But if somebody is getting on antibiotic and other dysfunction are reversing, that's why the rules they follow. We don't change anything. I would, I would, uh, sorry to interrupt, and I would disagree on that. The first day you can give whatever you like. After that, because adoption has already happened, it is not that it is an ongoing adoption. Yes, so drug levels will settle down. So unless you have facilities for therapeutic drug monitoring, I would not recommend double the dose uh, forever. Even for we. The loading dose should be the maximum whatsoever you can have, respect yeah. yeah. because the distribution volumes are higher in most of the patients uh, because of the low protein binding and other losses of it. But the loading dose should be good, irrespective of the patient's uh, renal failure or anything. But no, if I have this concern, what my option? My mention is, I said if patients start getting better, renal dysfunction reversing, <laughs> getting long, then yeah. if it is worsening, then you reduce accordingly, yes. according to that. But if things are getting better, I don't change it. That's what I want. Yes, sir. I want to just what uh, I don't know if you have that experience. We have started doing research on the monocyte distribution drift. Uh, in for diagnosis sepsis, we are doing it routinely for all patients now. Uh, good number of patients, I would say. If it's a 19, that's the cutoff value. That goes uh, daily, we are monitoring, it goes 30, 20, 30, 40, like that. It's such a fast moving uh, parameter for sepsis. And secondly, it's a plus point like GMB leads to more of uh, PCT. And it's costly also. And uh, this goes with the whether it's a gram positive, gram negative infections, monocyte distribution width along with the CDC. We are doing it okay. But that's a very good indicator. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.